Hi there, I'm your host, Mr. Doyle, and this is A Great Undertaking. In this video, I will be discussing Children of the Corn, which was the first of many screen adaptations that came from Stephen King's collection of short stories, Night Shift. There's something like a dozen Children of the Corn movies, most of which are god-awful, and, and well, this one, while considered a classic by many, has a polarizing reputation at best. History and Background Directed by Fritz Kirsch with a screenplay written by George Goldsmith, the 1984 movie version of Children of the Corn was a low-budget film that was incredibly successful at the box office. With a paltry budget of only $800,000, the movie raked in over $14 million in ticket sales. Although King himself had written a screenplay for the movie, the script was scrapped in favor of Goldsmith's, which featured more violence and more conventional narrative structure. According to Goldsmith, the first 35 pages of King's screenplay consisted of the story's lead couple, Bert and Vicky, arguing in their car. I'm not entirely surprised, as approximately three quarters of King's short story is in fact the couple arguing in their car. I can see why that wouldn't make for a great movie, and also, Children of the Corn was one of my least favorite stories from Night Shift for exactly this reason. King and Goldsmith argued over which screenplay was more effective in a phone conversation, during which King argued that Goldsmith did not understand the horror genre. Goldsmith essentially claimed that King did not understand that movies and books are different animals and that they must be approached from different angles. Following the release of the film, Goldsmith revealed that much of the story was a metaphor for the revolution in Iran, with the takeover of the town by quasi-religious zealots acting for an evil god based on the Ayatollah Khomeini and his revolutionary guard taking over Iran. Goldsmith says he was using a horror film to expose the dangers and evils of religious fundamentalism, something that critics failed to realize despite the fact that it was pretty obvious, in my opinion. Uh, despite the film's overwhelming success at the box office, early reviews by film critics were harsh to say the least. Roger Ebert gave the film one out of four stars, writing, quote, by the end of Children of the Corn, the only thing moving behind the rows is the audience fleeing to the exits, unquote. Vincent Canby of the New York Times wrote, Quote, As such movies go, Children of the Corn is fairly entertaining if you can stomach the gore and the sound of child actors trying to talk in something that might be called farm belt biblical. Unquote. Ian Nathan from Empire Magazine gave the film three to five three excuse me three out of five stars, applauding the film's originality while simultaneously criticizing the film's obvious budgetary constraints and poor special effects. Something we'll talk about more a little later. TV Guide gave the film one out of five stars, calling it lame, and criticized the film's, quote, gratuitous visual style, unquote. Although the film was not well received at the time of release, it has gone on to find itself among the top ten of many best of lists and still maintains a level of cultural relevance, with references to the film showing up in South Park episodes, the animated movie Wreck-It Ralph, and in songs from artists as varied as acclaimed hip-hop artist Kendrick Lamar and heavy metal band Children of Bodom. Is it by the book? For those of you who haven't read the short story, here is a brief synopsis. A dysfunctional couple traveling by car through rural Nebraska and surrounded by endless fields of corn come across a dead body lying in the road. As they seek help, they come to find that something isn't right, and they believe correctly that they are being watched. They gradually begin to understand what they have stumbled into, but not until it is too late. The remaining inhabitants of the small town, a merry band of murderous child cult members who don't take kindly to grown-ups, have found them, and it doesn't end well. As I mentioned earlier, the majority of King's story takes place in the confines of a car and is basically focused on how much the couple, Bert and Vicky, have come to hate each other. In the movie, however, they are a happy, loving couple, and the movie doesn't spend nearly as much time focused on their relationship. This was a welcome change, as the short story was kind of boring until the last quarter of the story, in my opinion. 
In the short story, we barely spend any time focused on the children themselves, whereas the film gives us a much more in-depth look at the hierarchy that has developed and the characters of Isaac and Malachi, the movie's lead antagonists, are focused on a great deal more. We also have the addition of a few key characters and some added layers of religious extremism, as well as themes of pre premonitory visions and supernatural occurrences give the movie some added spice. In King's story, the supernatural elements and he who walks behind the rose appear to be purely fictitious and a sort of mass hysteria that has implanted itself in the minds of the cult of misguided children. But the movie takes a different approach and shows the audience that there is undoubtedly an evil, otherworldly force which has driven the children to commit their heinous acts. Another big change from the story to the film is the ending. While I actually prefer the story from the movie to the short story in a lot of ways, I do wish that the movie had kept the dark ending of the short story rather than adhering to a and they all lived happily ever after approach. Soundtrack and score. Angelic yet somehow menacing choirs of children, dramatic timpani strikes, eerie organs and synths all make for a unique horror film score. There are some genuinely fitting, creepy sounds at times. It falls flat on occasion when attempting to combine these various sounds and instruments, but overall the vibe works well within the movie. Cast and Acting Lead actors Peter Horton and Linda Hamilton, who played Bert and Vicky, are pretty good. Their performances aren't award winners or anything, but in terms of 80s era King films, they're among the best. Hamilton is best known for her role as Sarah Connor in the Terminator franchise, while Peter Horton would go on to a directing career which includes episodes of The Shield, Grey's Anatomy, and The Wonder Years, to name a few. John Franklin, who plays the young cult leader Isaac, is a very unique actor in that he had a growth hormone deficiency and was actually in his mid-twenties and a college graduate when Children of the Corn was filmed. Franklin was an excellent casting choice for the role in my opinion, and his age and intellect helped him to sell the character, even if the dialogue was a little over the top. I'm convinced that Courtney Gaines, the actor that played Malachi, is where redheads got their bad name. When people say that gingers have no soul or that they are evil, I believe it is Mr. Gaines' role in this film that is the direct origin of these stereotypes. Gaines' performance is kind of awful. When he isn't talking, he is brooding and intimidating. But when he speaks, or in some instances, shouts, it's hard to take him seriously. There are a few more minor players in the movie, and. All of them are pretty bad. Special effects. Oof, uh, this movie does all right in the special effects department until the grand finale. These 1980s computer effects are so bad that it essentially ruins anything good that it had going for it prior to the final 15 minutes of the film. Once again, folks in the 80s were so enamored by new and innovative technologies that they mistook them for being of high quality. These effects not only didn't age well, they were laughable for the time the movie was made. In terms of practical effects, the film does fine, but most of the brutal stabbing deaths are off camera and we just see a spray of blood or the violence is implied but not displayed. However, in an early scene, we see someone get hit by a car, and that was a shocking and uh, well-done display. Final thoughts. I really want to like this movie, but it's just not for me. The fact that this is one of my least favorite King stories doesn't help. It has its moments, but overall, I don't see any reason that I would ever go out of my way to watch this movie again, which I suppose says it all. Apparently, Sci-Fi remade this movie in 2009, so I'll be suffering through that version too, and I have a bad feeling that it's not going to be any better than this one. Okay. Goodbye. Be sure to click like and subscribe to the channel for my continued analysis of all things Stephen King, pretty pleased with blood and guts on top. My name is Mr. Doyle, and this has been a great undertaking.